turkey one for you, wasn't it? <laughs> Took a little break. Thank you so much. Also, the zebra. Survivor. 
I work hard, I take care of my personal responsibilities, I'm not perfect, I'm not okay, right? But that's the problem. We're not perfect. And the Bible makes it pretty clear that God is not satisfied with anything except perfection. Stay with me. Let's hear what God wants you to strive to be perfect. You should be the perfect spouse, the perfect son or daughter. You need to be the perfect worker on your job. You need to be perfectly loving, perfectly patient, perfectly kind, perfectly generous, not just in your actions, but also in your thinking. You need to be a perfect Christian, a perfect person of prayer, a perfect worshiper, a perfect student of the Word of God. You need to have perfect priorities. As Jesus says in these words, be perfect as your heavenly parent is perfect. We all go, oh my gosh, I'm in trouble. <laughs> but you and I know that this is the case. We are not perfect, are we? We are not perfect. And because of that, we need we need Jesus. And God knew that. God already knew that about us. God said, I've got to help them. And so that's where God comes into the picture and says, we need this grace. We need God's grace offered to us through God's Son, named Jesus. Do you remember what it means to repent? There are three R's I'm going to give you today. And the first one is to recognize your sin. Where have you been less perfect in your life? Look back on your conversations, on the way that maybe you've dealt with people around you. Think about your relationship with God. Think about your thoughts. Where have you been less than perfect? We have to recognize our sin. First and foremost, and confess that to Christ. The second R of repentance is receiving forgiveness from God. So not only do we recognize it, confessing it, we also then receive that forgiveness. God forgives you for all of your imperfections. Because of Christ, your sins are gone. God holds no grudges, keeps no records of wrong. God forgives you completely. And the people that came out to John to receive God's forgiveness through the sacrament of baptism you also have done that. And you receive that same forgiveness when you were baptized. And every time you hear of God's forgiveness spoken to you, you receive it over and over, don't you? So that second R is to receive God's forgiveness in you. And that final R is reforming your life. Reforming your life. It means that after you've been forgiven for being so impatient, you become patient in your life. Right? After you've been forgiven for having a bad temper, you become more gentle. After you've been forgiven for being so greedy, you become generous. After you've been forgiven for being disobeyed and making excuses to God, then you begin to obey God. Not because you have to, but because you want to. You change from a self-centered worshiper of pleasure to an others-centered worshiper of God. The final R of repentance is when your life is reformed. It's changed from how it was before. There was a man visiting a school, and he offered the, a prize to the pupil whose desk he found in the best order when he returned. But when will you return, one of those students asked. <coughs> that I cannot tell, the man said. A little girl who was known for her unkept desk announced she was going to win the prize. Her classmates laughed at her. But I'm going to clean my desk the first of every week. But suppose he comes at the end of the week, one of her classmates said. Well, then I will clean it every morning, she says. Right? But he might come at the end of the day. For a moment, she thought about that. And she said, I know what I'll do. I'll just keep it clean. <laughs> Imagine that. 
I'll just keep it clean. In other words, I'll always make my U-turn of repentance. I'll always keep it clean. We're given the power by Christ to repent, to make that U-turn in our lives. But sadly, many of us are like the geese in the following fable. The geese in a certain farmyard decided to gather together every seventh day. And at that time, one of the geese would mount the fence and preach to the fellow geese about their lofty destiny. And they would praise God for the gift of flight. They would recall the exploits of their ancestors. And the congregation of fowl would flap their wings in hearty agreement. And this routine happened every single week. Hmm. After each assembly, the geese would break up and waddle to their respective places in the farmyard and eat the grain that the farmer had scattered on the ground just for them. On Monday morning, the geese would chat about Sunday sermon and discuss what might happen if they took to the skies once again. They might get lost. Or even worse, they might get shot. There was little doubt among them that the best thing to do was to linger in the fur bar with its security. The sermons would stir them, and that was sufficient. It was good to hear that they could, what they could be, and what they could do, as long as they didn't have to do. All the while, they didn't realize they were being fat for the holiday table of the farmer and his friends. Mm. So I wonder how many of us are like those geeks. Do we think about all that we could be, but do nothing about it? We can fly and soar with Christ, but we have to repent first, and we have to make that U-turn, and we have to allow God's love and grace to change us from the inside out. So how do I find courage to confess my sins, all my sins to God? How do I know that I'm really forgiven? Where can I find strength to change, to reform my life? How does this take place? What would John the Baptist say to you? Well, he said it to all of us in the scripture. He said, after me will come one more powerful than I. The thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop and untie. Someone is coming. Someone greater than you and greater than I. He is the one who will give you courage to confess all of your sins to God. He is the one who will take every single one of your sins away. He is the one who will strengthen you and change you into a new person, a new creation. And John said, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Someone greater, more powerful, more compelling more amazing than anyone that has ever lived. Someone is coming. He will demonstrate his power in all kinds of ways. His miracles, his resurrection, his gift of the Spirit on Pentecost, and his gift of the Holy Spirit and faith and hope and love to you. John had a message, didn't he? That message has not changed. It's the same one. Christ came for us, for each one of us, for the forgiveness of our sins. One thing I've noticed recently is that there's a lot of holiday recipes being shared. A special recipe for eggnog, or pumpkin pie, or whatever it is, for dressing, you know, the list goes on. It's a special recipe so we can have the perfect Christmas dinner, right? And it's not just our time of year for sharing our blood, it's a time for sharing our recipes. And you're going to taste some of those in a little bit, I guess, uh, at the banquet. But obviously, John the Baptist didn't have a lot of recipes that people would be interested in, unless you're playing eat grasshoppers and wild coming for your Christmas dinner. But what would John the Baptist say to you if you were to ask him, what is the recipe for a successful Christmas? I want to have the best Christmas ever. What is that recipe? According to our text this morning, John will tell you there are two main ingredients. The recipe for a successful Christmas is this. A heart 
full of repentance. Remember those three offers. And a heart full of Jesus. That will get you a successful Christmas. It's not about all the presents under the tree. It's really not about the turkey that's in the oven or the cookies or the pot. It's not even about the family around your table. It's about repentance and Jesus. Let your Christmas preparation be a time that is filled with more than just the advertising and empty cliches. Caring and sharing and family and giving and charity are all good things, but not just for Christmas, but all year round. These things cannot be truly enjoyed or carried out until you first understand that Christmas is a time for repentance and a time for Christ. It's a time to rejoice that someone has come, someone greater than John the Baptist, greater than you or I. Someone has come who is the reason for the season. Do you hear what I hear? It's a voice of one calling us, calling out of the wilderness. And his message is one of repentance and love. And may we be the people who herald his message and that we join John and we say to the world, here's Jesus. Amen.